It was 50 years ago that the world first saw those pictures and heard those now very famous words as Neil Armstrong became the first person to set foot on the moon. I'm Amelia Mosley and today we're bringing you a very special episode of BTN from here at the CSIRO Parks Radio Telescope in New South Wales, all to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Let's see what's in store. We'll find out what it took to get to the moon, learn more about Australia's role in that historic moment and explore the future of space travel. But before we get to that, let's go way back to the beginning, to a time before smartphones or the internet, to find out why anyone had the crazy idea of going to the moon in the first place. Let's find out more about the scientists, the explorers and the world events that played a part in what's known as the space race. Space travel has been dreamt about for a long time by artists and writers and scientists. But it wasn't until the 20th century that scientists made leaving Earth a real possibility. World War II saw huge advancements in rocket science as both sides worked on missiles that could travel huge distances. Once that war ended, many of those same scientists played a part in the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, a collection of communist states that included Russia. They were the world's most powerful countries at the time, and while they'd fought together in the Second World War, they had very different political systems and were competing for power. While they never directly fought each other, they were working on powerful weapons including missiles that would be able to launch objects into space. On July 29, 1955, the US announced its plan to put an artificial satellite into Earth's orbit. Four days later, the Soviet Union made the same promise. And so began the space race. For scientists, especially in the USSR, it was a wonderful opportunity. They'd worked on space technology for decades, and finally their leaders were spending money on their research. On the 4th of October, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, Earth's first artificial satellite. It was only 58 centimetres in diameter, and its batteries only lasted three weeks. But Sputnik's journey taught experts all over the world a lot about Earth's atmosphere. It was a massive win for the Soviet Union. In response, US President Dwight Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, creating NASA, which was set up to take care of all non-military space activity. The next step for both countries was human space travel. They tested the technology with dogs, monkeys and other small creatures. And in 1961, the Soviets hit another milestone. On the 12th of April, Yuri Gagarin became the first human launched into space. His capsule, Vostok 1, went around Earth once before he ejected from the capsule and landed with a parachute. Uh, beginning to rise, agonizingly slowly. One month later, Alan Shepard became the first US astronaut to orbit Earth. The job of those early space explorers was incredibly dangerous. They were doing something that no one had done before and testing technology that was still in its very early stages. But in 1962, the new US president announced an even bigger goal. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. <laughs> NASA created Project Apollo and Project Gemini with the aim of developing the technology needed to put humans on the moon. Of course, while the US was racing towards the moon, the Soviet Union was doing all it could to get there first. Their haste led to problems on both sides and there were tragedies. Like the death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov during a space flight, and a fire that killed the crew of the first Apollo mission during a ground test. That was a huge blow for NASA, 
But Apollo kept going as scientists developed better and safer technology. In 1968, the crew of Apollo 8 became the first humans to orbit the moon. They tested out communications, scouted for landing sites, and took the most amazing photos anyone had ever seen of our home. Finally, the US was leading the space race and was almost ready to take on the next challenge, man's first steps on the moon. Less than a year later, NASA was finally ready for the main event, a manned trip to the moon. The mission was called Apollo 11, and it was crewed by Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong. Let's find out more about their amazing journey. 30 seconds and counting. July 16, 1969 was definitely not a normal day, especially if you were one of these three guys. After years of training, planning and preparation, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin were about to go to the moon. Yeah, the actual moon, just a lazy 384,400 k's from Earth. It was such a unique opportunity that was presented to a group of us who came along as pilots to be given the opportunity to go into space and to uh, go and maybe land on the moon. What a wonderful thing that I'm here. What, what a magnificent achievement it is for humanity. 10, 9, ignition sequence start, 6, Apollo 11 took off on a Saturn V rocket, still the tallest, heaviest and most powerful rocket ever built. It was built in stages, designed to break off and fall to Earth once the fuel had been burnt up. At the very top was a small command module, where the crew spent three days eating and sleeping and exercising and going to the toilet. Apparently, the crew wanted to call it Snow Cone, but NASA thought Columbia was more appropriate. It was attached to the lunar module, named Eagle, designed to take Buzz and Neil to the surface while Michael waited in Columbia. But landing Eagle was tricky. Four forward, drift into the right a little. NASA control and the world held its breath. And then... Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Neil Armstrong was the first to step out of the lunar lander, becoming the first human to set foot on another world. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. I love this line, but apparently he meant to say one small step for a man not for man, but it's still a great line. Then it was Buzz Aldrin's turn. Neil and Buzz collected nearly 22 kilograms of moon rocks and dust, set up the American flag, and of course, took these incredible photos. The important achievement of, of Apollo was a demonstration that Humanity is not forever chained to this planet and our, our, our visions go rather further than that and our opportunities are unlimited. After an astronaut sleepover on board Eagle, Neil and Buzz rejoined with Michael and made for home. They landed safely as heroes, but then had to spend three weeks quarantined in a caravan, just in case they picked up any alien diseases. By the time they got out, they were famous faces. There were giant parades and celebrations around the world, including here in Australia. In the years that followed, NASA sent more people to the moon. But it was the original journey that captured the imagination of people everywhere. We learned quite a lot out of going to the moon. And now to go to a much bigger, much grander objective of another planet in our solar system. Eventually, humans will leave the sun and the solar system and go to other stars. Eventually, not in my lifetime or yours, but 
we'll, we'll learn how to do that. What's the name of the place on the moon where the eagle landed? Was it the Sea of Storms, the Sea of Tranquility, or the Sea of Troubles? It was the Sea of Tranquility. It's not actually a sea, it's a flat area of rock called a mare formed by an ancient lunar volcano. Imagine what it would have been like to watch in real time as humans did something we once thought was impossible. Well, there are plenty of people who remember the moon landing, probably even some of your family members. We asked kids to ask their grandparents what that historic day was like. How old were you two both when the landing of the moon happened? 27. And what about 23. you? 23. How old were you in 1969? I was 40, wasn't I? Where were you guys when all of this happened? That's the thing I remember best because we got the afternoon off school. We were living in Boston in the United States. I've been a teacher in Bloemfontein. Uh, it's in the middle of South Africa in the Free State. I was at work. I worked for CSIRO, Division of Soils in those days. Yeah, well, I was still at school and we all the whole school stopped. And we all just um, looked at it on an old TV, a TV that had to turn the channels, and clunk, yeah. clunk, yeah. clunk. There's no remote control. We didn't have television in South Africa those days, so we had to rely on, on the radio for news. And it was late evening after dinner, mm. and we stayed up and watched. How did the moon landing make you feel? It was the culmination of waiting for about 10 years. I had been waiting this, for this with anticipation following the Apollo series. We all thought it was very exciting because it was something that we would never have thought would happen. Well, there was enormous coverage of it because it was, it was good news at a time when there was actually rather a lot of bad news around. So this was really good news. So everybody was interested. And of course it was a remarkable event. Um, totally astonishing. What was going through your mind while it was happening? Astonishment, really, you know, and relief that they'd landed. And I do remember at night time looking up at the moon and thinking, wow, there's, there's people up there. I did that too. Yeah. How did you feel when they came back to Earth after the mission? It was a huge achievement when mm. you think about it, because it's one thing to blast a rocket off into space, another thing to get it back safety. How did you feel when they landed back on Earth? Oh, relief. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So. And also the great feeling that I had actually seen a great part of history. After that, we know that it is possible if you are really dedicated and if you want to have success. Did you know when they landed on the moon, the Apollo astronauts left behind a small disc inscribed with messages from 73 countries in tiny print? 600 million people around the world watched the moon landing on TV. And did you know most of those images were picked up right here in Australia? In fact, Aussie scientists played a big part in the Apollo 11 mission, and so did this big dish behind me. It's a pretty cool story. Let's find out more. On July 21st, 1969, these kids in Perth crowded around the TV to watch mankind's giant leap, just like other kids did right around the world. Except Aussie kids got to see it just a fraction of a second earlier than anyone else. And that's because the vision was picked up right here. In fact, without Australian telescopes and Australian scientists, it might not have been broadcast at all. You see, because of the rotation of the Earth, NASA needed different tracking stations around the world which would see the Moon at different times. Three of those tracking stations were based right here in Australia. 
NASA's Honeysuckle Creek and Tidbinbilla, both near Canberra, and CSIRO's Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales. How important is the role of the Australian stations in this mission? They're extremely important. In fact, Australia is vital to our role because the Honeysuckle Creek complex here in Canberra is one of three complexes in the world which are essential to the Apollo lunar operations. There are only these three stations and their backups. Honeysuckle and Tidbinbilla communicated with the craft and made sure things were going okay. Their job was to monitor things like the ship's status, astronauts' heart rates and data from inside their suits like oxygen levels and temperature. They also let astronauts communicate with Mission Control in Houston. Houston, uh, this is Neil, radio check. Neil, this is Houston, loud and clear. Break, break, buzz, this is Houston. Uh, radio check and verify TV circuit breaker in. Honeysuckle received and relayed to the world the first images of astronaut Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon. But minutes in, it was the Parkes radio telescope and its 64-metre dish that had the clearest and best picture. And it was used by NASA for the rest of the broadcast. But it very nearly didn't happen at all. We have a number of 100 to 1 chances and a number of 1,000 to 1 chances. All these have been backed up. Uh, perhaps our biggest weakness is the weather. If we get a very severe storm and very high winds, then we'd no longer be able to keep tracking. Park's radio telescope was positioned waiting for the moon to rise when, yep, things went wrong. Huge winds hit at speeds of up to 110 k's per hour. It shook the control room and blew the dish around. But the wind slowed, and just as Buzz Aldrin activated the TV camera, the moon rose into the telescope's field of view, and the rest is history. History immortalised in the movie The Dish. We've got the moonwalk. Hey? The moonwalk? What the pick up? Turns out it's the largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. What's it doing in the middle of a sheep paddock? The weather was still bad and the telescope operated well beyond its safety limits. But hey, we got the best pictures and they were great. NASA stayed on the vision from Parks for the rest of the two and a half hour broadcast. But all three Aussie telescopes and the people that worked on them played huge roles in the mission. And 50 years on, the role of this famous big Aussie dish in humankind's big moment is still celebrated. I'm standing right inside the Parkes Telescope in the control room and I'm here with John Sarkissian who is the CSIRO Operations Scientist here at Parkes. John, it's very noisy in here. Clearly the telescope is doing something. What's it working on right now? That's right. We're, well, we, we're actually observing with it and we have astronomers in California near San Francisco at Berkeley University and they're scanning the skies looking for evidence of intelligent civilization. So it's extremely exciting what we're doing here. We also do much more. Some of the, the great discoveries of the telescope include the, the first discovery and identification of quasars. They're the most distant known objects in the universe. Um, we also study pulsars. Um, pulsars are the very um, dense, compact remains of massive stars that have exploded. It's actually a major area of research at the telescope, and we've discovered more pulsars than all the other radio telescopes in the world combined. So obviously the dishes story didn't end with Apollo 11 then? No, it didn't. In fact, the Parkes Telescope supported all the, the manned um, lunar landing missions, but the most critical one was Apollo 13. When the oxygen tank exploded while they were en route to the moon, it crippled the spacecraft and they really, NASA needed the Parkes Telescope, its great sensitivity, to detect the very weak signals that was being transmitted from the spacecraft, and they were able to use that and analyse the problem and help save the mission and ensure that the astronauts returned safely to the Earth. Um, other missions we've supported um, um, since then have been, for example, the Curiosity rover when it landed on Mars a few years ago. That was really exciting. It only lasted seven minutes, but everything worked beautifully. And when it landed, we were all sat very, very happy and celebrated. It was great. And just a few months ago, we also tracked the Voyager 2 spacecraft as it was leaving the solar system and moving into interstellar space. And so what are you hoping uh, the telescope is going to be able to do for, say, the next 50 years? 
Well, you know, the, the telescope has a great history of discovery and, um, and of, of scientific achievement. Um, we have great plans for the future also. You know, we're, we're commissioning new radio receivers that will make it even more efficient. Um, we're, we're trialling new types of receivers too that allow us to see more of the sky at the same time so we can do um, surveys that will hopefully discover new objects, things that we don't even, we're not even aware of at the moment. And that's the great excitement. That's why we love doing the radio astronomy. Amazing. Well, hey, I don't know about you, but I'm hanging out for that alien life to be <laughs> discovered, so you never know. Well, we, I promise you if we find something, yeah. You'll be one of the first to know, <laughs> along with seven billion other people. So. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks, John. No worries. <laughs> Of course, a lot has happened in the 50 years since Apollo 11. More people went to the moon, there were space stations and spacecrafts that went further than ever before. And there's more to come. So before we go today, let's take a look into the future of space exploration and some of the world-changing moments you might be able to look forward to. What coordinates are the sedimentary rocks in? 7 twos, 14, eh? This is Ground Control. Its mission, collect and analyse samples from the planet Mars. Is there any chance the rocks have holes in them? It might be just a simulation, but these students are hoping that one day they'll be involved in the real thing. I would like to become an engineer, yeah? Um, because since I was a child, I, I love like um, building stuff, like solving my own stuff. I'd like to be an astronomer because all the infinite space you can explore and all the new things you'd find, new technologies and new possibilities. I feel like a physicist would be really cool. Um, the stuff that you do on the surface seems quite interesting to me. It's not as far off as it sounds. Experts reckon that humans will make it to Mars in the next 50 years. So in your lifetime. But of course, there's a lot of work we need to do before we get there. Starting with a return to this place. NASA's currently working on the Artemis program with a plan to return astronauts to the surface of the moon by 2024. But Artemis is more than that. Its eventual goal is to set up an extended human presence on the moon, aka a moon base. NASA is building a spacecraft that will orbit around the moon, like the International Space Station orbits Earth that astronauts could live in and launch from on missions to Mars. But this won't be Space Race 2.0. It's not just Russia and the US involved anymore. There are private space companies and countries all around the world have their own space programs, which often work together and they've achieved some amazing things. While Mars might be a few decades away, we can look forward to some space milestones that are just around the corner like a new space telescope and our closest ever look at the sun. Australia's also got a lot to look forward to. We got our own space agency last year. And while little focus on domestic stuff, like satellites for the farming industry and communications, people are hoping it'll open the door to a journey like this for real one day. It really makes me look forward to what's going to happen because when they go up to the back up to the moon, they'll like learn new stuff and get new technologies to hopefully go to different planets like Mars. It's just amazing that soon we could possibly be living on moons, on Mars, and even in space, and travel further on. Well, that's it for this BTN Apollo 11 anniversary special. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly had an awesome time here at Parks. We'll be back next week with another episode of BTN, but in the meantime, you can always head to our website or check out BTN Newsbreak online and on ABC Me every weeknight. I'll catch you next time. Bye.